I'm going to talk on uh, MRI and some of the implications of scanning somebody with a cochlear implant and specifically a retained cochlear implant magnet in place, uh, safety and imaging quality. Uh, I have to, this is an acknowledgement and also probably a disclaimer, I'm not an MRI physicist at all. I borrowed this from uh, two of our chief MRI safety officers at Mayo, Drs. Edmondson and Watson. And in honor of Dr. Watson, I put a picture of me with the mustache like he has up there. So why is this relevant? Um, uh, cochlear implants are one of the most significant and one of the most successful uh, neural processes that have ever, ever been developed. There's no other sense that you can restore as reliably as you can with a cochlear implant. And because of the wide success of cochlear implantation, they've, the number of people that have undergone implantation is increasing exponentially. So now it's estimated that over 500,000 people have been implanted worldwide. And then paralleling that, there's an increasing use of MRI. MRI is more safe than CT from the standpoint of no ionizing radiation. It provides better resolution of soft tissue structures. And so the number of people that are undergoing MRI is increasing exponentially. It's estimated that at least half of us and probably all of us will have an MRI at some point in our lifetime if we live long enough. Um, and uh, in California, for example, 5% of the population get an MRI every single year, which is pretty significant. In, ma in many situations, it's not just coincidence that you're getting the two things together, but there are some diseases where you're going to put a, a cochlear implant in patients who need auditory rehabilitation, but also need frequent neural monitoring. So it could be the patient with NF2, could be a person with superficial siderosis that develops sensory neural hearing loss and needs a uh, cochlear implant, or perhaps it was just coincidental that they have a GBM, the temporal lobe that you have to monitor, and they also have sensory neural hearing loss. And so a frequent imaging becomes an important uh, aspect with a cochlear implant in place. So to understand the implications and the safety issues with using a cochlear implant, having a cochlear implant in a scanner, we have to talk about some of the basic physics. This is an MRI scanner that costs about $1.5 million to put in. There's four or five, three or four major components to an MRI scanner. The most significant component and the, the thing it's built, built around is the superconducting magnet. Uh, the superconducting magnet is made of an alloy, a metal alloy, and it, in order for it to create a zero resistance system, it has to be supercooled to uh, 10 Kelvin or about 263, a negative 263 uh, degrees Celsius, and that allows uh, environment where you can pr produce a very, very strong magnet. It's the strength of the magnet's on par of the junkyard magnets that lift up cars and such. And the physics behind developing a magnet through, uh, through a coil is just as simple, but extremely more complex in many ways is the, is the homemade magnet that you can make by taking a battery and putting it through a metal coil and, and using it in, such, in a similar way. And here you can see that the static magnetic field is built around, uh, in a magnet is built around uh, this uh, wire cable or coil and with a zero resistance electrical current that goes through it on the order of several hundred amps. So MRI strength is measured in Tesla. 1.5 Tesla is just for reference is about 30,000 times Earth's magnetic field pull and 3.0 Tesla is twice that. What the scanner does is it creates a static magnetic, magnetic field. Um, and in the center of the magnetic field is the isocenter where there's actually very little gradient of the magnetic field. But on the periphery, and particularly at the mouth of the magnet, there's a significant magnetic gradient. And that's actually the area where people have the most pull from their implant. Because as you're going through that gradient, it's the change in, uh, the, it's the, change in the MRI gradient that actually causes the pull or risk of uh, moving your magnet. So technically, the most dangerous part of an MRI scanner is about one meter outside the bore one meter outside the, the mouth of the magnet. So in the hu naturally in the human body, our hydrogen ions, our bodies are composed of a significant number of hydrogen ions, or a significant portion of water, 70% of our composition, and also fat. And naturally in our, in, our, in our state outside a scanner, all of our molecules are randomly flying around our hydrogen ions, and it creates a net, neg a net zero balance. But when you're placed in a strong magnetic field, static magnetic field, the majority of your the hydrogen ions also align with that field, and that creates a very controlled environment where small differences can be detected in the scanner. So the second part of the magnet is the gradient coil. Gradient coils are placed in three orthogonal planes to each other, and they allow you to get sagittal, coronal, and axial images. This is just how they're referenced in a, in a scanner and what they look like. And so, again, this is what we saw before. On the left is what you would naturally be with when you're outside a magnet, but when you're put inside a large, a strong magnet, 
all of your hydrogen ions align in B0 or the magnetic field or the axis of the magnet. And then these uh, gradient coils will actually give small pulses. That's the clicking you hear in an MRI scanner. It's the, the pulsating of the radio frequency um, pulse going on and off. When it goes on, it pushes your ions slightly out of field. And when you take it off, it releases them from their high energy state and it gives off a signature of energy that can be detected. And different tissues give off a different signature. And so you can differentially detect different tissue types or pathologies uh, with that. To understand T1 and T2, you have to think of um, sort of like a top. So in, in, in mainly what the magnet is doing is it's aligning your poles, but there's also uh, a, a, a small amount of sway or wobble in all these ions. And so realignment of your pole, of the, of the poles with the magnet, when it get, goes from an excited state to a relaxed state, yeah, it provides you with your T1 in uh, uh, the release of the wobble or so when you apply a mag an RF pulse it pushes all the wobble to one side when you let go uh, when the when the RF signal is released it'll it'll go back to its resting point and that relaxation of the spin spin or the wo the wobble of the ion is what gives your T2 then lastly the RF coils and that for simplicity though that's the coils that actually detect the differences of released energy when you go from a high energy state to, a, to its natural state again. And so you can have body coils and you can have surface coils. Body coils are uh, basically housed immediately within the bore. They're farther away from the body. And because of that, they give poor spatial resolution. You have to give a stronger RF a radio frequency pulse to, to acquire uh, your data. So if you put a surface coil on or a local coil, you requ it requires much less energy and you get better spa spatial resolution. So most of the time when we're putting people in the scanner for head MRI or extremity MRI, uh, we put a coil on. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. This is just what the different types of surface coils look like and bird cage coil for the head. So put it all together, you have your static magnetic field created by your large magnet bore. On the outside, you have gradient echoes that provide you with your X, Y, and Z axis, providing coronal, sagittal, and um, axial views. And then your radio frequency coils, which collect the signal after, um, this, after they've been excited and they return to a resting state. So the magnet itself, the large bore is always on. To stop it, it's not a switch on the wall. To stop it, you actually essentially wreck the whole system. So anytime a person enters the room, it's game on. You can't have any metal in the room. If anything flies into the magnet, you can't pull it away anymore, or it's very difficult to. And so all the safety involved with uh, scanners has to do with preventing somebody from getting in the scanner with something on their body that could hurt them when it's not in a controlled situation. And so any, if you can think of any implant that potentially has any ferrous component to it as being a risk of going into an MRI bay, uh, pacemakers, metallic implants, neurostimulators, and then, and of course, cochlear implants. And all these next slides are just, are, um, this isn't a talk just about MRI safety, but it's more to talk about how cochlear implants are affected by a scanner. And it ju this just shows you the force of the scanner with anything metallic in the system. So these are uh, ICU bed gurneys that got pulled into the, into the bore. A uh, child was a uh, six-year-old uh, in 2001 was killed by a, basically a ballistic oxygen tank that went in and crushed him when it was put in there accidentally. And uh, the in increasing number of accidents have led to, led to an outcry in the radiology community uh, call for better safety and regulation of this. And so in 2011, all MRI events were put on the same level as other really significant um, episodes in medical or surgical care wrong sided surgery, wrong patient surgery, uh, wrong, sur wrong surgical site, a retained foreign object, reformed body, or unexpected death in somebody who's otherwise healthy. These videos, again, just kind of show you the strength of the magnets. So imagine your patient going in the scanner with, an, with the cochlear implant in their head, and then also with a magnet in there, which makes it even more significant. So you can imagine that just going in there can pull on your magnet quite a bit and create, create some level of torque on the magnet itself. So because of these risks, most hospital systems have developed several layers of safety to try to prevent people from getting in the scanner in an uncontrolled um, way. And so this is an example of our order review when, we, when the nurse orders an MRI at our hospital. You have to mark, you have to ask the patient whether or not they have a cochlear implant or all these other items. 
And then when they go to the scan, they'll actually be verbally asked by the nurse again. And then if there's any question, x-rays will be obtained to make sure that there's nothing else um, in the body that was not, uh, not expected. But sometimes all the holes in the Swiss cheese align and somebody can get through uh, all of those safety layers. So sometimes a person can get in the scanner with an unsafe item. So this is an example of a patient who got uh, put in a scanner for a head scan with non-safe, not an MRI safe or MRI uh, compatible uh, devices, uh, uh, clips. And that this sort of system or this sort of um, situation allows you to think about some of the maneuvers that you would do to reduce pain for a CI patient also. So they have these safety maneuvers to reduce pull or injury that could happen when a person's in a scanner with a ferrous item. And so the same things you can apply to a cochlear implant patient. So basically you don't want to turn their head quickly. You don't want to turn their head in the bay. And when you pull them out, you want to go really slow because it's the, it's the transition over those gradients that create most pain and most pull. That's particularly so when you're at the mouth of the magnet. And so you'll keep them on the, on the bed for as long as possible and you wheel them directly out of the room slowly. As a last resort, you can quench the magnet. And that's basically releasing all the supercoolant and that creates a large plume of exhaust um, from, the, from the helium. Uh, and that itself is quite dangerous. It can cause asphyxiation from the displacement of oxygen. It also can create frostbite. This is a dead bird outside the, the, <laughs> the MRI safety units after they quenched a magnet. So stay, stay out of that plume. Um, so there used to be, we used to use different terms for whether or not an item was safe to be in an MRI scanner, a device was safe to be in there or not. Um, so we used to use MRI compatible, but it was felt that that was not a good term because that implied that it was very safe to use in an MRI scanner. So we developed different terms uh, in 2005. There's MRI safe, MRI conditional, and MRI unsafe. So MRI safe are items that have no ferrous component to them and um, have no theoretical or practical risk of having any type of interaction with the magne static magnetic, magnetic field. And then cochlear implants fall in MRI conditional. That is, there is a risk to having them in the scanner, but under controlled situation, under controlled scanning protocols, it can be done with uh, relatively low risk. So again, everyone likes to use the term, oh, you know, the new advanced bionics device, the 3D implant. Um, is MRI compatible. It's not MRI compatible, it's conditional. And uh, again, that has different implications of saying those two different things. So if you look at where we are right now with cochlear implants and their, um, their conditionality uh, for use in, in an MRI scanner, advanced bionics uh, can, with their new device, the Ultra 3D, has a self-aligning magnet. You can put them in the scanner at 1.0 or 3.0, uh, 1.5 or 3.0 Tesla without removing the internal magnet, without actually putting a head wrap on. The cochlear device, you need a head wrap at 1.5 Tesla, but for 3.0 Tesla, you still have to remove the magnet. Then Medel also has a self-aligning magnet, so you can put them in the scanner without removing the internal magnet. Um, so if you, if you do cochlear implants, you'll see that the, the, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the center of the antenna is, a, is the small magnet. The small magnet looks like a little watch battery. It's cylindrical and flat. Um, and when you, if you're wrapping a head to try to remove, to, to reduce magnet movement, intuitively you'd understand that uh, you want to place some sort of firm platform on the magnet to keep it from turning. And so that's what the splints are. If you're going to wrap somebody's head, you, so you place a splint on top of the internal magnet on the outs, outside of the skin, of course, flush against that, and you'll wrap it with some type of compressive banded, bandage, and then you can apply a surgical tape. All that does is it's not to make the whole cochlear implant not move or anything like that. All you're trying to do is keep that disc uh, magnet from turning up or getting displaced. That's the main risk that happens. So there's different uh, manufacturer scanning uh, parameters that can be used. They limit the Tesla, and they also limit something called the specific absorption rate, and that's the amount of energy um, transferred into a tissue over a certain amount of time. And so lower energy has lower risk to the, to the tissue. We'll talk about that in a second. I just wanted to give a really quick overview of what these self-aligning magnets are. So those, the MRI field, a static magnetic field, will naturally pull on a, on a ferrous object, and even more so if it's uh, another magnetized object, it will try to realign the other magnet to align with its own field. And as you can imagine, that could be very painful, particularly if the patient's head is turned a certain way. So the self-aligning aligning magnets can rotate internally to create the least amount of pull within that static magnetic field. 
Med-L has an internal magnet that rotates in two degrees of space, and uh, Advanced Bionics has one that's just released more recently that can reorient itself in three, in three different dimensions. So theoretically, perhaps the Advanced Bionics device is a little bit less painful and a little, little bit lower risk, but they both seem to do very well. Then there's MRI unsafe. These are usually sharp objects that uh, are ferrous, so you can imagine why those would be so dangerous. Um, even though a lot of a lot of devices now MRI conditional, a lot of centers won't scan patients, and it's because the radiologists don't really have much to gain from doing it. It creates a lot of extra time. It's a lot of extra headache. You have to have a physicist available, MRI physicist. You have to have an, a dedicated radiologist at that scanner. And oftentimes, there's an otolaryngologist or somebody else available to help wrap the head or check the device afterwards. So it's kind of a pain to do. And if anything happens, it's, it looks bad. So a lot of places still won't scan patients, even though it's considered FDA um, MRI conditional to do so. So what are some of the things that can happen to a magnet, uh, to a cochlear implant magnet when it's inside an MRI scanner? Well, the first thing is when the mag internal magnet tries to align with the static magnetic field, it can pull on it really hard, which can cause pain. It can also twist the magnet, so it will actually come out of its, most magnets are, a lot of magnets are held in place in a silicone sleeve or casing, and it can actually pop out. The second thing is that alternating um, radio frequency pulse, you know, wire can actually cause a current, an alternating current, which can cause heat because there's resistance in the wire. And so you can actually heat up the metal, which so it could burn, uh, theoretically burn something in the body. And all of the cochlear implant electrode is insulated in silicone except for the end, the contacts. And so all of the heat would be given off in the contacts, which is inside the cochlea. So technically you run a risk of heating up the inside of the cochlea, injuring your spiral ganglion cells or something like that. Um, the gradients can also mess with the battery, um, its ability, it, it's, it's uh, charge, uh, but also can mess, it, it also can mess with the circuitry. So sometimes patients will, act, it can actually activate the device even though your external processor's not on. They'll actually say they're hearing sounds in the scanner, which is interesting. So those are all the things that happen to the, that can happen to the device in place, but also it can compromise scan quality. So if you're getting, if you put a person with a cochlear implant in an MRI bay, and you're scanning their leg, all those issues of injury to the device can still happen, but it's not, you're not gonna get an artifact on your MRI scan from scanning your leg because the, the device is so far away. But if you're scanning their head also, the magnet can interfere with, the, with your homogeneity of your static magnetic field and create this artifact, this, this sphere of uh, distortion around the device. And you might not be able to see your anatomy of interest. If you're trying to image a temporal GBM, maybe you can't see anymore because there's so much distortion. Um, so there are some things that MRI, sorry, that uh, cochlear implant manufacturers have done to reduce the risk of putting a, a cochlear implant with the magnet in place. They have shielding of the device itself that protects the circuitry. By limiting the, um, the, the, the heating of the device, they can, they can if you limit the, uh, your RF power limits that you're using, you can cause less heating. With current protocols, it's estimated that the the electrode itself probably heats up about three degrees Celsius currently. Um, and then it can be monitored very closely by the laryngologist and physicist and uh, trained personnel. This is just an example of creating an alternating current with uh, heating up the tip. Um, this is, uh, so we talked earlier a little bit about specific absorption rate, but that's basically the amount of energy you're putting into a certain volume or certain mass over a certain time. And that, a great, an elevated SAR or a higher SAR level can cause more heating of the internal device. So again, if you use a body coil, you have to use a lot, you have to put a lot higher radio frequency, a stronger radio frequency pulse in to get the same level of signal. So using a local coils or um, head coil in particular uh, can reduce your SAR and so you can scan more safely. So this is just example of the SAR map, uh, the amount of resistance and heat you can generate in the body using a head coil or uh, extremity coils versus that uh, whole body coil. So that's, those are the issues uh, that pertain to the device itself. But then when you talk about the imaging itself, you get imaging artifact with the magnet in place again because it throws off the homogeneity of your static magnetic field. So you can get artifact up to 10 centimeters away from your, uh, from your implant itself, which can obviously uh, make it difficult to sometimes visualize 
an intracranial process. And so this is some examples of significant artifact from uh, leaving a magnet in place. There are things that the radiologist can do um, to reduce the amount of artifact. So um, fat saturation techniques require very good field homogeneity and that magnet inside there reduces that. And so fat saturation techniques are particularly susceptible to magnetic artifact. And so there's a special scanning protocols your radiologist can employ to improve your visualization of structure. So this is uh, fat saturation correction that was used. Magnetic, um, or sorry, band artifacts can also be created, particularly in Fiesta or KISS sequences. Those are the heavily, heavily weighted T2 sequences that are very fine. They're really nice for posterior fossa imaging. And just by changing the tilt of the head, sometimes you can improve uh, some of your band artifacts. Uh, this is another example of uh, your radiologist changing the type, uh, type of sequence that's used to reduce metallic artifact. It's called a maverick um, sequence compared to a non-maverick sequence. You can see the significant reduction in metal artifact. And the same thing with DWI. Uh, different types of DWI sequences can result in more or less amounts of artifact. So putting it all together, when you have a patient who comes in with a cochlear implant in place and you think you need to get a scan on them, or you, a scan is being requested, um, the first thing is you have to decide, is a scan really needed? And if, it's, if it is needed, can you use an alternative? Could they get an ultrasound if it's for an extremity or something like that? Or could they get a CT scan instead of an MRI? Because of course, then there's no issues with it. Then you want to identify the make and model of the device because different ones have different condition at, can, uh, MRI conditional status under the FDA. You want to counsel the patients about the risks of doing it. The alternative of putting the patient in the scanner with their cochlear implant and the retained magnet is removing the magnet. That's what we used to do all the time. We'd, they'd come in, we'd make a small incision over the device to take the magnet out, uh, sew it up with uh, a suture, have them go in the scanner, have them come back out, we pop the magnet back in. Then they couldn't use it for about a week because you have a fresh incision right over the site. Small risk of infection because you just open it up. So it's inconvenient, it's OR time, patients don't like it. So that's an alternative. If they say, I don't want to go in the scanner with the magnet, you can do that still, but most people would rather go in the scanner with it in place. Uh, it often is painful for patients. It can pull pretty significantly and cause some discomfort. So you have to tell them about that. Um, we have a consent. It's a verbal consent. They don't actually sign it. We just kind of, we read this to, the radiology tech reads this to them when they go in the scanner so they understand the risks of doing it. And again, you have to counsel them for the potential of pain. When you're putting them in the scanner, you want to put them on uh, the bed outside there, have them lay flat, and you roll them in very, very slowly. And the closer you get to the scanner, the, the slower you put them into, into the MRI bore, and just because it's, that difference in gradient is more significant the closer you get to the bore. While in the scanner, make sure you follow the manufactured guidelines uh, for that particular device. Limit the a uh, specific absorption rate is specified by the manufacturer. Use surface coils because it requires less uh, strength in the radio frequency pulses and minimize your Tesla strength. So most, most scans can be done for most purposes on 1.5 Tesla. Your radiologist should be viewing the scans and uh, seeing if they're getting too much artifact and adjusting appropriately during the scan if they can. Have the patient have a method to communicate uh, with, the, with the radiology team if they're having pain and they want to stop it. There are some situations where the patient can't tolerate going in the scanner because of anxiety or pain, and you can put them under general anesthesia and still leave the magnet and not remove them. We'll do that sometimes if the patient's very, very anxious. And then afterwards, when they're outside, when they're, when they're done with their test, you have to do a couple things. You have to look at the site to make sure it's flat. If there's a small bump, it means the magnet turned on end. At first, it just hurts a little bit, but over time, it'll start wearing down. Then you'll get a little ulcer. Then it will actually extrude, so it's a big problem. Um, you want to look for swelling, and then you want to counsel. If you have increasing pain over the next couple of days, you have to come back in because the magnet might have moved. And this is just what it looks like inside when the magnet moves. You can see on the first example, bottom left, it actually tilted up a little bit. On the next one to the right, it flipped up on end, so it's 180. Sometimes it'll actually flip over, so the one on top, the magnet actually did a complete flip over and you can see that the external device, the, the coil is, the magnet is flipped over and it, it adhered that way. So you want to palpate to make sure it's not sticking up. Sometimes you'll, you'll have a little pain and sticking up a little bit. And what everybody wants to do is they want to take them to the OR and reseat the magnet back in the sheath, but you can actually, you tell them, I'm sorry, it's gonna hurt a little bit, but you push really hard and it will pop it back in. You don't have to take them to the OR. I just did somebody uh, just the other day. 
It works probably 70% of the time when it's popped up like that. If it's popped up on end, you have a 50-50 chance of having it flip the right way. <laughs> if, if it goes the wrong way, then you just go to the OR, which was what the default was before anyway. So you're no worse off. It's just what you would have done before. Um, so this is just some, uh, this is a study that we published previously looking at our experience uh, putting patients with cochlear implants and retained magnets through the MRI scanner. This is from 2012 to 2014 um, in 1.5 Tesla. We wrapped the heads, uh, that's our fellow. Um, so there were 16 patients with 19 implanted ears that underwent a total of 34 uh, potential events, uh, it's 34 times where one ear with an implant was put in the scanner. So some of these patients had multiple scans. Um, there's just the demographics. Uh, most common indication for repeat scan with a cochlear implant in place was NF2. There are some other patients with non-NF2 intracranial tumors and then some of them were non-head scans. Um, there are two episodes of all those that, that didn't tolerate, that pain was just too severe. So we either put them in the scan or sedated with general anesthesia or we took the, uh, the, the magnet out. There weren't any device failures. I'm not aware of actual, so th theoretically it could hurt the circuitry inside the device and cause a, a failure. I'm not aware of any report of the device actually failing ever. Everyone says it's a possibility. If the magnet can'ts, you can actually just pop it back in place if it's not too bad. If it reverses polarity, you can either turn your external um, uh, your external device uh, magnet, you can actually flip the polarity on that also and just use it backwards, or you can flip the internal one. This is just an example of what it looks like. This is a patient with NF2 that underwent cochlear implantation after they, had, uh, they lost their hearing on a middle FOSS approach. And you can see that their magnet flipped up. He had a little pain, it got red over time. Uh, and then we took him to the operating room and you can see on the bottom left where it's outside of its silicone sheath on the right, you can actually see a small tear in the silicone sheath, but that's what it looks like. What about the artifact? Is the artifact prohibitive? Can you not see enough, uh, can you not see the, the disease of, of interest? Well, the, the artifact is less if you remove the magnet. There's still some artifact from just the device itself. Um, so if you really need to reduce your artifact, you can remove the magnet. But overall, there's only one time in all those uh, scans that we felt the, uh, the artifact was so significant we couldn't see what we were trying to see. And what's interesting is not only can you change the sequences, but also your different planar views will actually give you different views. So sometimes you might not see it on axis at all, but you'll flip it on coronal and you can see it really well. It's not a perfect circle. It looks like it is on one plane, but you'll flip it to another plane and all of a sudden you can see what you're trying to see. Now these are, just to show you that you can even get closer to the implant, these are patients with inner ear pathology. These are interlabyrinthine schwannomas. So the one on the left, so all of these, the top one is before the MRI, sorry, before the cochlear implant was put in. And afterwards, after a cochlear implant was put in through the, through the tumor and gave them stimulation, you can see, you can even see the inner ear pretty well, these patients. But some of, every once in a while, you'll have severe artifact that's problematic. Um, I've talked about different ways to change sequences to improve visualization. So in conclusion, 1.5 Tesla MRI can be performed in most patients with CIs without magnet removal. Um, imaging artifact usually doesn't impede your view of what you're trying to see. If it's really bad, you can uh, manipulate the sequences you're using, ask your radiologist to manipulate the sequences they're using, or you can remove the magnet if that doesn't work. It, your magnet might flip or can't in about 15% of the time, but about half of those you can actually just push it in place uh, externally without actually doing a, a surgery or manual reduction, you want to call it external reduction. Um, other times you have to surgically do it. Um, if, if all else fails when you're trying to get them in the scanner, you can also, you can just do what we always used to do, make a small incision over the device, take the magnet out, get the scan, put it back, put the magnet back in and have them go on their way. That's uh, everything, thank you.